All right, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to be talking about adventures in data and uh, leaning on Kubernetes storage to run hundreds of real-time analytic databases. As you'll see in a moment, I am a database person. Let's just jump into the intro parts. My name is Robert Hodges. I've been working on databases for over 40 years. And as a database person, we love storage. Uh, Kubernetes has made it very interesting because it's quite different from the storage that we, the things we used to love about storage, which were things like battery back cache and firmware versions and RAID and stuff like that. There's a whole new set of, of resources that we have to think about. Um, been working on Kubernetes for uh, since 2018. My day job is I'm a CEO of a database startup called Altenity. And what I'm going to be talking about here is actually based on our experience in that startup. We are a service provider for ClickHouse. Five years ago, we made a decision to move our processing, to make a bet, basically, that Kubernetes was going to be the wave of the future for uh, management of data. That has turned out to be true in spades. And among other things, we, as part of that bet, we built an operator for, first of all, for ClickHouse, Popular Data Warehouse, uh, a service that I'll be talking about a little bit here. And um, then built a cloud on top of it. Have There's now, at this point, thousands of clusters uh, running on this. We ourselves in our cloud running, are running about 240 prod clusters, uh, data warehouse clusters, at this time. Um, some of them are pretty big, you know, sort of 24 nodes, 40, uh, uh, 40 terabytes of attached storage. Uh, these, are, these are not small. So uh, that's the engineering. And in fact, as I go through here, I will be talking about specifically about ClickHouse so that I know what I'm talking about. But just about everything we do here is generalizes to other database systems. So let's just talk a little bit about analytic databases and introduce ClickHouse. So ClickHouse is what's called a real-time analytic database. And there's some kind of marketing words here that explain it. But <clears throat> What's simpler is to explain what it does. Imagine a security event and incident management system. It could be a multi-tenant system, say, run by some big company like Cisco. It could be reading tens of millions of events per second that are based on, you know, pulling data from various types of sources and looking for trouble. People breaking into systems, uh, you know, calls to servers, uh, DNS uh, requests to servers that are... Uh, you know, our known malware sources, things like that. So very high rates of ingest. You also want to be able to react to things that happen quickly. If somebody does start making those DNS requests, you want to know about it. Moreover, you want to be able to go through the whole history that led up to that event. So being able to, you know, for example, be able to scan over billions or even trillions of rows, trillions of rows to find out what's going on and zero in on the cause. This is the kind of problem that databases like ClickHouse solve very well. So what's the architecture to do this? So this is a database that is optimized for reading large amounts of data very fast. So there's a number of features here. I'll just highlight some of the key things. Uh, it uses columnar storage. That's not really relevant um, when, we, when we think about the underlying disk or, or SSD that represents it, but that's a fundamental part of it. Um, in modern analytic systems, uh, we, of course, we tend to have block storage. Uh, you know, using cloud block storage, for example, we'll talk about that quite a bit, or SSD. And also, increasingly, you see uh, S3 or S3-compatible object storage used as backing stores for the tables, sometimes for the source data itself. We won't talk about that so much in this uh, presentation. Uh, databases like ClickHouse are complex distributed systems. So this just shows two nodes, but uh, and with replication between them. So that'd be one shard of data, two replicas, but they could have 10 shards of data, three, uh, three replicas each. These are quite large systems that communicate through networks. So that's the architecture. We're gonna be putting this onto Kubernetes and then figuring out how to make it access storage efficiently. So the first thing I'll talk about is mapping that database to Kubernetes. And since this is Kubernetes and it is a database, of course, we're going to start by writing an operator. So when we started this back in 2019, operators were not that common. Um, it was, I don't know when the model officially, uh, you know, sort of joined Kubernetes, but it was not long before that. But basically an operator, if you haven't used one before, 
allows you to define new types of resources. Uh, we call this a custom resource definition and then supply the operator, which is a special kind of controller, which can basically carry out operations to make that resource definition become reality. And the thing that's really cool about them is that the, the resource definition allows you to take a complex system like ClickHouse, like Druid, uh, like Cassandra, and reduce it to maybe two feet of YAML, which you can then you know, kind of uh, reason about, change easily, and what the operator does is when it sees one of these YAML files come up, it goes out and looks at the corresponding resources that should be there in Kubernetes to make it reality. If they're not there, it creates them. If they are there but different, it changes them. That process is called reconciliation, where you're looking at, looking at what the, the, you know, the desired definition, desired state of the world is, the resources, and you make it happen. So the first design question that we had, which was relevant to storage, was how to even represent uh, a database like ClickHouse in Kubernetes resources. And I think, how many people here are familiar with stateful sets? Everybody, yes. Uh, so uh, stateful sets um, are the, the sort of standard abstract, you know, low level abstraction in Kubernetes for dealing with data. They have a notion of a, you know, a fixed name for, the, uh, for each replica, and then logic to make sure that you can connect that replica to storage, um, and if the replica restarts, reconnect it, stuff like that. So the question is, if you, you know, just starting with a simple example like this, where we have a database running in a container and some storage that we want to talk to it, what's the right representation to actually result you know, down on some worker node, you know, having a process that's talking to, uh, to some block storage? So um, what we ended up choosing was to use stateful sets. Uh, as I'll describe, there are some limitations to them. But what you see here is a stateful set. Um, it defines a pod that represents, in our case, a couple of containers that, that manage the data or manage the database. And it has a persistent volume claim. In fact, it could have a number of them uh, where, you know, because we, we often have uh, things laid out with multiple uh, multiple volumes, uh, but a persistent volume talking to, uh, excuse me, a persistent volume claim that then corresponds to a patch of storage represented by a PV. Um, so that's the basic abstraction, but then the question is, should you just lean on that? For example, I talked about replicas. Should we use stateful sets to do that? Um, and it turns out the answer is no. Uh, and this has to do not just with storage, but with the way that databases work in general. And the thing is, in clustered databases, even though, yes, these things should all be, you know, these things should be cattle, not pets. I mean, in the database industry, we've kind of resisted that. They, in fact, are more pet-like than you would like. Uh, database replicas often have different resources. Like, they could even have different, differing amounts of storage, different types of storage, uh, different distributions of volumes. They could have different um, software versions. They could be in AZs. A very common thing in databases is to, uh, particularly clusters, is to have some nodes be uh, dedicated to ingested data and the other ones dedicated to reads. For this reason, you have, a very, you have the potential for very asymmetric architectures. And as a result, what we, we made a design decision very early on to go ahead and use stateful sets because they have a lot of good properties and they do map the pod to the storage in a fairly convenient way but we just used one stateful set per database server. And this doesn't seem very exciting now, but you, you can believe we spent like literally weeks thinking about whether this is the right thing to do. Um, and then once we did it, we stuck with it. So that's the, basic, um, that's the basic map. And what that means is that the CRDs, and what we did further beyond that is that when we defined our CRDs, we actually imitated the good parts of stateful sets, which are the pod template that allows you to define the pods, and it's very flexible. You can do whatever you want with the pod definition. So when you look at our CRDs, you'll see we refer to pod templates, and then we also have uh, stateful sets have volume templates. Uh, we have a, a volume claim template, but it used very similar syntax, almost identical to a stateful set. What that means is you can configure the pods and the, um, and the volumes virtually any way you want, because we allow all of, the, um, you know, all of the relevant syntax. Uh, 
So this is the top level. I don't show the pod templates yet and the volume claim template because I'm going to show them in a couple slides from now. But we basically, in our, in our CRD, the key point is we then imitated the stuff you know and love from stateful sets. So I'm going to take a quick detour here because now we're going to start to talk about storage in a little bit more detail. And um, if you were going to EBS, let me ask a question for the crowd. If you're going to EBS, you're doing a rewrite performance test, and you're going to SSD, which would be faster? How many people would vote SSD? And let's say NVMe SSD, and it's locally attached. How many votes for SSD? How about, how about EBS, block storage on Amazon? Uh, one brave soul. You won. OK, let's. Uh, so let's look at this. This is, and this is relevant because the, it, uh, it then leads us to some things like uh, separation of storage and compute. So here's the basic architectures, um, you know, for a database that's going to be talking to, in this case, mapped to uh, a process running in an i3-4x large VM, which is sort of an older um, Amazon VM that has attached uh, NVMe SSD, and then another volume, or excuse me, another VM with elastic uh, block storage, or EBS. And what's kind of interesting is when you test these guys, um, here's a, there's a popular test called ClickBench. It's used to uh, uh, do benchmarks against ClickHouse and also other databases. When I run this test and allow the storage to be cached, in other words, to you know, run it multiple times so that the pages are pulled into the page cache, one really interesting result that pops up is that that EBS uh, attack, the, volume, the VM with EBS storage is universally faster, has higher performance than the, uh, than the NVMe. Uh, this is a test where smaller is better. The red line is the EBS uh, attack, uh, VM, and it's faster in every single case. And so that's just one simple example of how sometimes storage behavior in database is not quite what you think. And in this particular case, um, you know, we asked, you know, why is, why is it faster? Well, it turns out, since we're mostly reading out of memory, it's clock speed. Uh, the, the, I, the i3 is kind of an old, older Xeon. It's got a clock speed that's about two-thirds of the speed of the, uh, the M6i. And that accounts for probably most of the difference we're seeing there in these performance test results. Now, you're thinking, I came here to hear something kind of obvious, but what's interesting is if we test it again, and even if we force um, the, you know, direct I.O., we actually get similar results, which is kind of surprising. This is another run of the same test. And actually, we have the NVMe direct. That's the blue line. The red line is EBS. You can see they're pretty much the same. Not a lot of difference. We even threw object storage in there, S3 storage. That's also really fast. And part of this is because databases like ClickHouse are designed to dampen out the effects of storage. So that's important because it means we can use EBS, block storage, for these database clusters. So that's a kind of interesting finding, something that, again, was not obvious to us when we got into this, but then has major consequences going forward. Let me just dig into one of them, separation of storage and compute. So in modern database systems, as much as possible, we want to break the, the bond between the storage and the compute that's applied to it to, do, to it to do things like calculate page bounce rates or time on page or, um, you know, sort of histograms, things like that. These are relatively compute intensive. And depending on how often you do them, you might want to have powerful VMs and, or you might want to have weak VMs because there's a huge cost difference. And what's cool about Kubernetes is if you use block storage in the cloud, you basically get separation of compute and storage for free. And so we lean pretty heavily on this. Um, so this is, some people will say, oh, that's just vertical, uh, you know, that's just vertical scaling of database nodes. But the fact is, it works. And it means that you can choose, by choosing the node size, the most expensive part of many of these database uh, systems becomes variable. So here's a simple example. What we do, and this is actually really important, is we, in uh, databases, tend to like having a VM to themselves. 
because they like, for example, they make assumptions that they own the entire page cache and that they have access to all RAM that they can see on the machine. When you're running in Kubernetes, Kubernetes does not hide the fact that if you're in a container, Kubernetes doesn't hide the fact that you may have 16 gigs of RAM. Everybody can see that. So somebody has an assumption that I'm going to use 16, I'm going to use 90% of that, and you have a couple of them running, they will contend with each other. So we run them on um, each on a VM, and then of course we have the attached storage, uh, which we're going to raise as, as they need more data. So how do we do that? Well, that just kind of, you know, if, if you know how um, compute and storage are allocated, um, here's an example. We set up the VM, or, or set up the Kubernetes clusters, and first of all, for the VMs, we'll use a provisioner. In our production systems, we typically use node groups. Um, our, our cloud guys like them better. Personally, I use Carpenter because it's, it's very flexible, and you install it once, and it works for all VM types. But the other thing that's important for storage is that, of course, you have the, in, in modern Kubernetes, particularly managed Kubernetes, you use a CSI driver, which then has a connects to a provisioner that can allocate EBS. What you actually get allocated, the properties of what gets allocated are controlled by the storage class. So the storage class will, will say things like, oh, it's GP3 storage on Amazon uh, EBS, um, and you can set the number of IOPS, you can set the throughput up to a, a, a gigabyte uh, per second, so on and so forth. So this is how storage gets allocated. And if you set this up properly, it then becomes very easy within an operator like ours to use this, this well-known label, uh, the instance type, and just say, hey, you know, give us M5, uh, give us M5.large. So um, this doesn't, again, is not very profound, but it has uh, incredible effects for databases because it allows us, this could be a very large cluster, like it could have storage that, you know, holds a trillion rows of data. When I'm developing, I'll run on this instance type, and then what I'll do is I'll flip it to like an M6i 8x large when I want to do performance testing. I just make that change, and the operator will take care of basically um, reallocating the pod with a new definition, and uh, boom, in the background, old VM drops, new VM is, uh, comes up, and it now has extra compute horsepower applied to storage. So this is, this is really, really nice. In Kubernetes, it just falls out of the box. I'm making this simple because normally I would do some other things. Like I have the node selector and you can see I've got a, a selector for zones to put it in a particular availability zones. I would also do things like add anti-affinity so that I'm not going to have two ClickHouse um, servers trying to be on the same VM at the same time. I would probably also, in a heterogeneous system, I would probably add um, you know, taints and, and tolerations so that I could make sure I'm also not contending with other services that aren't ClickHouse. But this is all very, very easy to do, and it's just a few inches of YAML. So, um, and then the volume claim templates, which are the other part, are equally easy. So we can just pick the storage type name. Um, you can, what's, you know, if you're just playing around, you don't have to include a storage, a storage class. But um, in this case, I wanna be sure I'm getting GP3 because this is good storage, very performant. I want it to be encrypted, and then there's the size. Um, that's, again, all I have to do to allocate storage. Moreover, um, let's see if I have the, I'll get to this in a second. Um, the, I can now extend this storage while the system is running, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So, again, this is, this is kind of cool because these are things that are actually essential to making these large analytic systems work efficiently, particularly cost efficiently and they just fall out of running on Kubernetes. There's, we, do, we do have users that are still doing this through Ansible on VMs, and believe me, every time, every time I work with one of those folks, I get a sinking feeling because we're gonna have to help them get their Ansible scripts you know, fixed so that they can deallocate VMs and then remount them uh, you know, on the new VM when it comes up, make sure everything gets properly installed, make sure all the mounts come up, it's, it's a total pain and Kubernetes just makes it happen easily. So <clears throat> with that, we can now map the servers, as I've said, precisely to the VMs in storage. And as I said before, I, you know, if I want to change it, 
I just change that value, resubmit the, uh, the YAML, and it happens automatically. So there's another cool thing. I mean, it's just like these, all these little tricks. And they, I, another really cool thing that drops out of this is because we're using the stateful set, do you guys know this trick about dialing the replicas to zero? Anybody do this? OK, if you have a stateful set, it has, a, it has this setting here, number of replicas. And that's the number of pods that get started, each of which is attached to storage. In our case, it's normally one. And it was that way for a while. And then we discovered this trick that if we wanted to just shut the pod off, like, hey, um, you know, I've got storage, but you know, I'm developing, I'm working nine to five, and I'm going home now. Let's just turn this thing off. You can just dial it down to zero. And at that point, what Kubernetes will do is it'll just shut the pod down, but it'll keep the storage alive. So this is ideal. So we use this to, um, to implement what we call uptime schedules. These are similar to what Snowflake does. If you've ever used Snowflake database, data warehouse, you can have a schedule to run your virtual data warehouse. You can also do this in Kubernetes very, very easily. And that's important because actually what we're doing with this open source database and Kubernetes with the operator, we're actually helping people. Our, part of our goal here is to help people build proprietary or, or sort of custom equivalents of Snowflake that solve particular problems. And Kubernetes makes this work very, very well. We also, I mean, you can just go patch the, the, the uh, replica set and do that. But to make this convenient, we actually add, added something to the YAML that we consume in the CRD. So we just say stop equals yes. That turns off the compute, and then you can go home. And you don't run up a big bill. So, and that's the effect. You'll just run it, and basically what will happen, your stateful set is still there, your persistent volume claim is there, but the pods, they just vaporize until you turn them back on again. So, but we're not done. There's still more tricks, and we've got 12 minutes. Um, so that was, we were feeling pretty good about this, but actually GP3, when it came along, how many people are familiar with the difference between, how many people use EBS? So elastic block storage. Okay, about half of you. What are you, the rest of you on Google or Azure? Okay, I, I see somebody nodding when I said Azure. Uh, yeah, so um, GP3 is one of these things where you wouldn't think this would be a big deal, but people were probably lifting beers in. Um, it's really good block storage. It's way better than the previous generation of elastic block storage, which is GP2. Um, includes things like the ability to set the actual throughput that you can dial it up and down. So you don't have, it used to be that EBS had these kind of weird, um, you know, sort of uh, weird rules where, um, for example, in order to get adequate throughput, we would end up stacking uh, EBS volumes. So, uh, you know, because it would, for every volume you added to the, to the VM, it would give you, you know, more bandwidth. We don't have to do that anymore. The throughput is, is uh, you can just dial it up and down up to 1,000 uh, megabytes per second. You can set the IOPS. Um, and there's also um, allowing volume expansion. I believe that one existed in GP2 already. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty confident it did. But the interesting thing is these can be set in the storage class now. So this is the storage class, and this is the definition of the storage, the class of service of the storage that you're going to get when you refer to this GP3 um, encrypted. There's just one problem. That is that these parameters, particularly those, that list of parameters right there, you cannot change them once they're set because CSI drivers, that the, the CSI interface doesn't know about these things and there's no way to get them from inside Kubernetes out to Amazon where they can get changed and actually do you some good. And people do change this stuff. I mean, we have people who will allocate, you know, sort of the lowest level of storage performance and then they discover things are slow they want to change it. So we need to give them a way to do that. So what we want to do effectively is have a simple way of changing these parameters on demand. And so what we did was we applied a kind of idiomatic pattern to uh, uh, use uh, for, uh, from Kubernetes, which is to build a controller for it. And so what we do when we make our persistent volume claims now is we add a um, 
uh, special labels or special annotations, I should say. And this is an annotation. You can see it has our name, alternity.com, on it, and it says throughput 1,000. This is a request on the persistent volume claim to go make this have higher throughput. Um, Kubernetes doesn't really know what this does. Kubernetes, you know, annotations, you can do practically anything you want. Um, so Kubernetes ignores this, but our controller that we built does not. So we have a controller called the EBS params controller. And what it does, and this is kind of an expansion of the model I showed a couple slides back, is we have the persistent volume claim. It points to a storage class. That storage class then is the, the, the EBS, uh, the CSI driver sees that, and it actually creates the volumes. That's, you know, that gets you the initial volume. But what we have is the, we also have these annotations which are on the claim. The EBS params controller is watching, and every time one of these claims changes, it will go out and it'll, actually, it'll take the, the annotations it finds and it'll actually apply them to the EBS service directly so that we can now make these changes to, um, you know, uh, to elastic block storage very simply from within Kubernetes. It gets better. So um, not only did we change the values, and this is totally simple. I mean, it wasn't really, it, it's, the, the, I think the, the controller is about this much Go code. It's really, pretty, really pretty small. One other interesting thing it does is it reads the current properties back from the storage device, from the volume, and this is turns out to be exceedingly useful because if you want to make changes to EBS volumes, you can only do them like ex expand it, for example. You can only do it once every six hours. Uh, so uh, one of the things we do is collect the the um, the, the state of the, the current mod, you know, is it completed or not? When did it start? When did it end? And this allows us for management purposes, again, from within Kubernetes to keep track of what's going on out there in, in cloud land um, and, uh, you know, and, and sort of manage it correctly. So um, I've used Amazon examples throughout here, but this um, controller we're actually going to be using, we're, we're now certifying Azure. We have users actually already on it, but we're certifying this controller to, to do the same thing as Azure. It turns out that Azure has similar um, uh, has a similar need to control storage. So this is kind of a cool trick. Um, one of the things that follows from it is that every now and then we have users who say, hey, you know, I've got 24 volumes. I need them changed fast. Uh, well, you can now just by applying these labels, this is a kubectl uh, annotate command. We can apply that annotation sort of lock, stock, and barrel to, for example, all of the, all of the persistent volume claims that are, um, have the label my-clickhouse. My and so we can apply this to all of them at once. So this is a very, uh, very useful if we need to do something quickly, otherwise, um, you know, we would have to go and, um, you know, sort of uh, do this in a much much more cumbersome way. So we can just get it applied instantly. Okay, so um, are we making good time here? So there's a final trick, and um, this is kind of interesting. One of the uh, uh, one of the great things, in addition to the fact you can reattach block storage, one of the other cool things about it is that in, in Amazon, in Google, in Azure, you can also extend its size on a live system. And that's totally cool because the most common configuration problem that we have, a resource problem we have in data warehouses, is people are ingesting more data and they go up, you know, they get 70% of, uh, you know, if they disk allocated, 75, 80, 85. Around the time it hits 90, then we're starting to get nervous because they could run out of storage. And then things will stop, they will call us, they will be mad, we will be, uh, we won't be happy. So, so what you can do is, of course, you can fix this in, like if you're just using a stateful set, you can go ahead and fix this by changing the storage allocation in the volume claim template. And that is fine because it actually gets the job done, but there's a problem, and in stateful sets, when you do it that way, what it's going to do is it's going to alter your pod definition and it's gonna cause the pod to restart. And that's bad because, um, why is it bad? Well, it could be really slow. 
data warehouses, when they open up, in fact, databases in general, tend to have to do things like go have a look at all the files that, that they're processing. They may need to rebuild caches, things like that. That's slow. You really don't want to restart a database. So one of the things that we recently added uh, back in May is we've actually taken the responsibility, we give users the option of taking the responsibility for managing storage away from the stateful set, and we just do it for them. And so what happens is this option right here says, hey, the operator is going to manage the storage for you. Um, we remove the template for it from the stateful set that we generate, and we do it in the background. And as a result, these operations can, can be taken without forcing the pods to restart. So that's the tricks that we've learned so far. I think there are others, but these were the, uh, these were the, the main ones. Um, let me just give a few final words. I think we're right on time here. Um, so learnings. I, Kubernetes is great for running databases. I want to emphasize that. And operators are, are probably the biggest single uh, reason for the, for the greatness. But the Kubernetes, I, I think another sort of secret power or not so secret power of Kubernetes is this, it, it does work portably across many environments. We operate in multiple clouds. Our users want the ability to run these clusters, everything from you know, Minikube on a laptop all the way up to, to, uh, to, to you know, clusters with you know, dozens or even hundreds of nodes in the cloud. Kubernetes does that. And so the, thing that, the things that, that we sort of got out of this experience are, first of all, build on the existing Kubernetes uh, resources wherever possible. We went with stateful sets. I think in the end, we're sort of, in the end, we're sort of taking things out of stateful sets, and we're at a point where you might say, hey, maybe we should have just had a different, you know, just implemented our own controller, our own uh, specific resource for this. Other operators have taken that, but we went with what was there, and that had the advantage of making it pretty flexible and easy to understand. Um, performance is important. There is no cost that we know of to using, to running things in Kubernetes as far as performance is concerned. Um, this was something we were, I, sh I should have mentioned this earlier, we had concerns that somehow Kubernetes, you know, maybe because it's using overlay networks or something like that, that it would affect performance. It does not. And certainly it has no impact on a process talking to storage because, and, the, and in the end, that's all that Kubernetes is managing. Um, there's, it doesn't insert anything in the way. But you definitely want to test performance carefully because how performance behaves with a particular application like a database may be very dependent on, on the use case and the way you're accessing it. This uh, Kubernetes plus cloud block storage, that gives you separation of, of, of compute and storage. That is such an important property for large systems. Uh, the ability to scale the compute which is often the most costly part of these systems, to scale it up and down efficiently um, and using an operator to do so without taking apps out by using rolling, rolling upgrades. That's, that's a really wonderful feature and actually has been one of the things that's allowed us to build a business on this. And then there's just, storage of course is complex. There are these extra parameters. There are these, these tricks you have to, uh, you know, things that you want to avoid like restarts. Fortunately, there's idiomatic ways to get around these within Kubernetes. It's a very flexible model. I think this, the controller pattern, that idiom of using controllers with, um, you know, that look for special labels is a very powerful one and can enable you to sort of hack around, excuse me, to engineer around uh, limitations in APIs. So where are we going next? Uh, I mean, the current stuff we've got works pretty well. Uh, there's two things we're looking at, first is object storage. I haven't talked about it much in this talk, and it actually isn't, isn't really something that Kubernetes has that much to say about because object storage like S3 is just another application service. It runs on the same network as your applications are using to communicate. But it does have some interesting storage implications because object storage does require, NV it does require caches to use it efficiently. You don't want to, typically you do not want to read everything from object storage. You'd rather, you know, if you're repeating queries, suck it over, um, you know, put it on fast storage locally and then process the blocks there. So we will be coming back to NVMe SSD. That will be more prominent in our architectures and this is why. Um, 
The other thing is will probably be we we're, backup is a big issue in all databases, in data warehouses. It's kind of an interesting problem because data warehouses often have such huge volumes of data that maybe you just don't bother to back them up. It just adds so much cost to your system. Maybe what you do is recreate stuff from source data if you have it. But we are definitely very interested in disk snapshots or volume snapshots, which are available in Kubernetes. Other operators have applied them very successfully, so that may be another place, uh, sort of a new uh, place that we're going in terms of uh, volume management. Some references, by the way, these slides are, are up um, on SCED. Um, I want to give special thanks. Uh, you know, I mostly work with spreadsheets and SQL and stuff like that. Alexander Zaitsev is our CTO. Vlad Klemenko is the engineer that wrote the operator. These guys are great engineers and have figured out, they and other people on the cloud team uh, are the ones who really figured out these ideas. And that's it. Thank you very much. And we don't have another talk, so if you want to ask questions, you can just step up to the mic, uh, or you can, uh, and we can go outside after a while, but I'd be happy to take, stay around and take questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, my question is with the use of uh, EBS or block storage, how do you deal with challenges around multi-zone support and dealing with failover? At least I heard EBS <coughs> will be multi-zone in the future, but at the yeah. moment it's not. Well, um, actually on Amazon, uh, EBS is, it's interesting. Uh, so Google block storage actually does have the ability to replicate mm -hmm. to other locations. Um, we don't use it. It turns out that ClickHouse data warehouses have are pretty good at replication themselves. Mm -hmm. So we just spread the we just use the pod um, uh, definitions to force them to particular availability zones and just make sure they're spread out evenly. So we'll we'll just we can operate perfectly well over AZs. Thanks. If I could ask one more quickly, uh, the data the benchmarks you showed. S3 was almost close to EBS, which was yes. surprising. So wh how do you explain that? I mean, yeah, how do we explain that? Well, you know what? The, that's a, it's a really interesting result. And there are two things actually to notice about that. I'm going to flip back to it. Uh, one thing is S3 is pretty darn fast. This is something that people don't realize that, like, for example, S3 and EBS actually compare pretty favorably. And the network performance on Amazon is very good. So. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Now, one thing that's interesting, the yellow graph, the, this is something you, where you actually can see a difference. All the little queries, so this is a log scale. Mm -hmm. So the littler queries, you tend to see a bigger gap between the S3 line. On the larger queries, you don't. What you're seeing there is the latency to go fetch data off S3. There is a real cost because the, it's a longer hop to, to get to the S3 data and get back, and you actually do see that in these test results. Um, the other thing is that, yeah, so S3, where it gets expensive is that S3 doesn't have a, a buffer cache. I mean, you have, to put, you have to write application logic to pull the data down and cache it in order to use it efficiently. So there's definitely, there's no free lunch here, but um, this is a, these are, these are relatively, uh, queries on relatively small amount of data. I think it's about um, 100 megs or something like that. And for that, S3 is very, very fast. Yeah, so uh, comment, uh, comment here. Uh, yeah, with S3, you get P90 outliers. Yes, you do. And, or P95 or P99. And yeah, anything that runs on a network. Moreover, S3 contends with other stuff your application is doing on the network. That's a key thing. EBS, I think this is, this is certainly something I didn't understand well, but EBS is a SAN, and so there's a separate network. The EBS, you will, and Amazon in particular, is very good at allocating bandwidth, so you won't, uh, you know, so you don't get contention with other things the application is doing. Uh, do you want to step up to the mic and just ask that so we get it? Are, are these S3 numbers through a VPC endpoint coming from like your VPC over Amazon's private backline, or are you going? We didn't do anything service? special. I I just set up a, a VPC and I'm going straight to Amazon. There's no there's no endpoint in there. Yeah. 
Yeah, S3 is, yeah, there's S3 is, has a bunch of, this is why I'm not doing this talk, because, so, yeah, so this point, yeah, there's special costs around S3. I think one that people really underestimate, and this is another reason for caches, is API calls can just, you know, blow you out of the water. Normally, people, you know, look at S3, and what's attractive about it is it's internally replicated. So you only keep one copy, you know, compared to block storage, where, like, we replicate maybe two or three ways. So already, that's a huge difference in cost. Um, but then, of course, you, you add in the API calls, and, and maybe it doesn't look so good anymore. Is that, you had another question? Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Does Alternity Cloud run on top of Kubernetes by using your operator? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, can you repeat that question, please? Uh, does Alternity Cloud run on top of Kubernetes? Yes. Oh. Cloud, you are Alternity Cloud runs on top of Kubernetes. Oh, does it run on top of Kubernetes? Oh, yes, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, completely. Uh, we are, we do 100% mm -hmm. of our processing is on Kubernetes. We don't do anything, out, we don't do anything on, on raw VMs. And so if we, will, we want to use Alternity Cloud in AWS, Yes. And do we need to build our Kubernetes no. cluster or not? All right. you, you can if you, but only if you want to. So the question is, do we want to, do we have to build our, do we force our users to build their own clouds? Mm -hmm. No, what we do is by default, if you, if you use our cloud, and this is, uh, there's other clouds do it the same way, we will build the Kubernetes in our own account and you just get an endpoint. And under the covers it's Kubernetes, but you don't know that it's there. Oh. What you can do, and this is, I think, another place where Kubernetes is very powerful, is because it's portable, we actually have a model where we can just, you can pop a container into your, your own Kubernetes, and it will form a management connection, a secure management connection with our cloud management plane. At that point, we can manage data warehouses in your Kubernetes. This is how we bring up people on Azure. So we don't formally certify Azure yet. We're getting there. Uh, well, we don't run it in our own account, is what I should say, but we can allow people to run it in their accounts. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, that's that's a great illustration of the portability of, of uh, Kubernetes. So now that, that we're here on the KubeCon, you mentioned all you have to do uh, to go around the uh, parameters that you specify in the storage class, because you cannot change the storage class first and... and, and uh, they, they, they will, they will ignore, ignore changes. So how do you think um, this can be modified to be able to do what you have done but without having like... A, a, uh, you know, what I would expect is, and I don't know, C, I don't know the CSI interface very well. Uh, in fact, I don't know it at all. I, I normally work in the database. Um, but I would expect there'd be some sort of custom parameters uh, argument that you could pass in so that you could, in fact, control, like have a way of taking those parameters and just pushing them through. That would, um, yeah, so. All right, so, I'll take uh, one more question and then, okay. we're, uh, then we'll, uh, we'll go outside. Yes, so uh, this is more on ClickHouse, I hope that's yeah. okay to ask. So uh, uh, one of the things we were evaluating and I wanted your input was, uh, uh, one is, you know, ClickHouse uh, being used standalone versus uh, ClickHouse being used as a query engine with the data in Parquet files in S3. You know, these are fragmented, yes. uh, you know, partition data uh, or chunking in S3. So, right. uh, so your thoughts on one versus the other? Oh, you mean, what's, you mean using it in Parquet versus yeah. using it in ClickHouse yeah, tables? I mean, one is use ClickHouse standalone uh, yeah. for everything. The other is use ClickHouse as a query engine yes. and data is in, par yeah. in fragmented, Yep, chunking, uh, chunked parquet files in S3. Yep. And so. Yeah, you know, that's a great topic. Like the, the difference, and this sort of extends into object storage, the, the difference between having uh, storage, you know, using things inside a table versus external mm -hmm. data. We're trying to merge those models. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, one of the things we're, uh, we were even talking about yesterday was to have a parquet, uh, basically part type, so that ClickHouse tables would just store the, the data in Parquet. We, we can read Parquet very well. Um, and 
what we're seeing is that in, in analytic systems, this is a, you know, sort of a, a secular development across many systems, is that Parquet is the favored long-term sort of read-only storage type. And people put it out on S3, and then you want to have your data warehouse be able to read it because it's fast and can do real-time query. But at the same time, you'd also like it to be accessible to, for example, your machine learning and, and AI. So, so there is ongoing work in ClickHouse. I think the most important thing in ClickHouse right now is just to make Parquet reads fast. Uh, yeah, and, and we have seen that things like predicate pushdowns, row groups yes. are done better in Parquet than ClickHouse. So. Um, no, actually, well, okay. So, see, Parquet is just a format. And, yeah. and so predicate pushdown is something that, which is, in other words, taking a condition and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of applying it, you know, within the Parquet, within the Parquet library. Um, yeah, that, it's just a matter of how well the database uses those features. And right now, there are some databases like DuckDB that are really quick on Parquet. Mm -hmm. uh, our first priority is catching up. You know, good, thank so. you. Great. I'm going to call it good because I, I think our AV guys got to go home. But thank you so much, everybody. Feel free to come. Yeah. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>